Do you want to know how large language models are actually being used in healthcare? Well, today's episode's for you. And my guest today is Rob Brisk. Now, I've just finished speaking to Rob and what a guy. So he is an NHS cardiologist. He's a computer scientist and he's done some incredible things in tech. He has worked for the Department of Health in Northern Ireland during COVID on outbreak modeling. He has worked at NVIDIA and worked on the UK's largest supercomputer, uh, which was doing life science and healthcare research, things like AI drug discovery, genomic analysis, things like that. And he's now at Olas Medical and he's had a heck of a career. I really related to Rob and I had a great conversation with Rob. He's a really humble guy. And despite all of these accolades and everything he's done, everything he knows about technology and computer science and healthcare, his feet are very much on the ground. And that said, um, I think he's going to make a lot of impact in healthcare. So Olus Medical is definitely worth checking out if you work in healthcare. It is free to use for healthcare teams. And what it does, it streamlines all of that kind of annoying stuff that you have to get everywhere when you work in a new hospital, which is uh, all your education stuff, the clinical information, the protocols, the guidelines, all of that kind of thing. So whether you're looking up local antibiotic guidelines, whether you're looking up the policy in your hospital for annual leave, it centralizes all of that stuff, which might seem relatively trivial, but anyone that's actually worked as a clinician in hospital will know and completely understand what a nightmare all of that can be. Crucially, though, Rob has a real interest in large language models and everything that's going on right now with GPT-4 and MedPalm 2 and BARD and all that kind of thing. Now, Rob's a, a proper computer scientist, so he really understands all of the technology behind it and what it can actually do. So he talks about, well, lots of different technical stuff, all the different elements, multi-headed attention being one of them, but lots of different actual technology concepts that make up large language models. But he talks very credibly about what these can actually do in healthcare and what he is doing with large language models at Olus Medical too, as being this kind of extension of search and and e easy to retrieve information. Um, we also build on that to what ChatGPT is currently doing, which is not only retrieving information, but then interacting with other platforms and then get things done. And if you subscribe to Health Tech Pigeon, you'll have noticed a couple of weeks we've talked about uh, large language models and AI transcribing interactions between clinicians and patients and then being used to then go and order the blood results or API into all of the systems you already used to actually create this version of healthcare where we practice at the top of our license. We have a fixed interaction with a patient, but that's all we do. But we're very fixated on actually caring for the patient, getting the history, getting the information, and actually technology can do the rest. Now, a spoiler alert, Rob thinks this can be done within the next 10 years. From a technology standpoint, it can actually be done now. And Rob knows this from how deeply he knows the technology, but we both acknowledge that really it's an adoption challenge within healthcare to actually get this done. But I think it's incredibly optimistic that this is doable from a healthcare perspective right now. We are going to see large language models play a massive role in healthcare and health tech. This episode with Rob sort of takes you on that journey to understanding how that's possible. We talk about Rob's background, everything that he's done. We talk about large language models broadly. And then we talk about these specific use cases, the sort of low hanging fruit, I guess you'd say, in what Olus Medical and are doing and others. But actually this bigger, longer term play that Nuance and other large companies are doing in order to kind of help healthcare more broadly. So Really interesting episode. I really enjoyed this with Rob. Really nice guy. Really easy to chat to. Um, hope you guys enjoy it too. So Rob, welcome to the Health Tech Podcast. We're going to have a lot to talk about here, mate, because you've got a fascinating background in all the same things that I believe in. You're far more qualified to do them. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to really indulge myself here in a lot of the questions that I'm going to ask you. But absolutely pleasure to have you on um whereabouts are you speaking from are you are you, are you guys based in northern ireland are you based in northern ireland or where are you practicing 
Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm based up in, I'm speaking to you from Belfast, based in County Down in Northern Ireland, and yeah, practicing there as well. So my, my wife's from Northern Ireland, that was the connection, we moved back a few years nice. ago. Nice. Um, yeah, not, not somewhere that ever occurred to me to end up, but fantastic place to be, it turns out, um, especially with Beautiful part of the world. Yeah, it really Absolutely, is. absolutely. Um, cool, man. So um, I gather you've listened to a few of these podcasts, so you know the drill, but I'm going to get you to tell your story. And there's plenty in there from uh, from working with the Department of Health, well, obviously being a clinician, working with the Department of Health, all that COVID stuff, computer science, data science. Looking forward to this, mate. So uh, yeah, for me and our listeners, why don't you tell us a bit of your story? Uh, I mean, I guess I, I was listening this morning uh, to the episode you recorded with Jack from Oka, and he went right back mm. to the you know his early childhood in the in the, the in rural Ireland. He did busking I've, on the streets of Northern Ireland. He went back yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was brilliant. Um, I, I wasn't planning on going back that far, but uh, I, I guess we're worth saying about that you know the early part of my life that I, I grew up in a generation. I'm, I'm guessing probably like you did, James, a generation of like the Sega Game Gear and the SNES and Absolutely. the Nintendo 64. And uh, so I, I think a lot of Game Gear is a great one, by the way. That is a that is an underrated handheld console that was yeah. just oh, glorious, yeah. just way ahead of its, it's time. Brilliant. Look at the Switch now. Like, nothing's really changed. <laughs> it's it, it, it absolutely hasn't. incredible. It was the first games console I ever had, and I must have been like seven or eight. I was really lucky to get one. Nice. And, um, and I remember this is back in the day, so I had Sonic the Hedgehog, and you couldn't save your oh, game. Yeah. And I remember being like an eight-year-old yeah. and getting to the final level of Sonic the Hedgehog, getting killed by Dr. Robotnik, and then just being inconsolable. <laughs> 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 so that was probably I think that's probably relevant to this story right because i guess from then on I, w- I was cognizant of the fact that computers you know could facilitate magical immersive powerful experiences and i kind of i felt fondly about computer technology ever since if that's not too ridiculous a thing to say um not so I, gu- I guess i was predisposed to being a bit of a geek from you know from early on in my life but I think my health tech journey really kicked off in earnest in 2016. So this is quite, you know, quite far along from from the days of the game year. And for me, we, uh, taking health tech seriously was born out of a bit of a personal and professional crisis back then. So 2016, I, I'm, I'm as I think you mentioned in the intro. So I'm, I'm, I'm an NHS physician by training. In 2016, I was a respiratory registrar. Six years into my career as a junior doctor, and until then, I'd really loved practicing medicine. I'd, I'd kind of loved everything about it. You know, the, the extreme highs and lows, the extremely steep learning curve, the camaraderie of the NHS. And then, you know, m- most of all, the extraordinary privilege that, um, you know, I don't need to tell you about, James, but of patients letting you into their lives mm. at these pivotal moments when they're very vulnerable. And I, I'd thrived in that environment for the early part of my medical career. But for me, it had begun to shift, and it shifted quite quickly, probably. In 2015, we had our third child, my wife and I. We had three children in quite quick succession. So we had a a three-year-old, a one-year-old, and a newborn at home. And my wife was suffering quite badly with postnatal depression uh, at at the time. Mm -hmm. She's very vocal about this. She's she's actually, since, you know, she's recovered and and set up a charity to support maternal mental health. So she's got her own really, you know, story that I'm in awe of. But but at the time we were kind of things were difficult at home, and I had that experience that I think probably a lot of medics have, where something changes to make you feel a bit differently about your job, and when you start seeing the downsides, you know, the long hours, the crazy extracurricular expectations, the the the, the short notice changes of location and the big commutes, it's like a, 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 a friend and colleague of mine just this week talked about peeking behind the curtain and not being able to unsee what you've seen. And I went through quite a rapid transition of thinking, oh, I'm, I'm not sure this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I still knew I loved clinical medicine, but I was, I was looking at, you know, several more years of training. And then, you know, consultant, the consultant life was not really a light at the end of the tunnel, even by 2016. You know, the, the, what, what the expectations of a consultant in a more and more senior-led service were changing. And I thought to myself, I, I don't want this to be the whole story of my career. That was kind of completely unrelated to health tech. And I made a decision that may have been slightly rash, but, you know, I guess once it was in my head that I didn't want to do this for the rest of my life, I I felt like I kind of needed to act on it. And I I was needed at home, you know. So I resigned my training number in early 2016. And 
took a job, a nine to five job in the cardiology department of our, of our local hospital. So jumped ship from respiratory medicine to cardiology medicine and was probably a little bit lost professionally. At that time, I was already, I was already, you know, thoroughly in touch with my inner geek. I, I'd got the programming mm-hmm. bug years and years earlier and I'd done a whole load of, uh, you know, web design and then game design in my spare time. And wow. um, I've heard you talk on the podcast about flow state, right? For me, yeah. sitting down and writing computer code, it's like it's like Lego blocks for grown-ups. You know, you get to yeah, yeah. undergo that creative process of conceiving of what you want to build. You get the creative problem solving as you build it. And then you get the warm glow of, oh, look what I made, right? So mm-hmm. I knew I loved that, but I'd not really had any sense of how I could make this anything more than a hobby in what little spare time I had. Then I read the AlphaGo paper, or, or at least I read news <laughs> articles about AlphaGo in, in 2016. And... You know, these days everyone knows what it is because there's been the Netflix documentary and whatnot. But at the time, I I read this news story and I read the quotes from intellectual heavyweights saying, this is huge, this is a massive leap forward in technology, this has far-reaching implications. And even even as a bit of a nerd, I didn't get it. Like, I I was like, what's going on here? You know, we'd had the Gary Kasparov, the the world chess champion, he'd been beaten by (laughs) IBM's Mm. Deep Blue Computer years earlier. Years and ago, I yeah. didn't get why it was big news that this had been transferred to Go. I, I think probably a lot of people felt the same. And I decided to go digging at that point. And I, basically, I haven't stopped digging ever since. I started getting you know, <laughs> into machine learning and then deep learning. And the more I learned, the more I thought, this, this is the technology of our time. This is going to change the world. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely going to change healthcare. And as a, as a frontline clinician, I could see all sorts of ways that over the course of my lifetime, this technology was going to have a huge impact, and I wanted to be part of that. And then there was more than a little luck in, in the rest of the story. So this, this department, this cardiology department where I'd taken a job, turned out to be that they were fantastically supportive. You know, I was a bit worried I'd show up and have the stigma of, you know, a training dropout attached to me. None of that. They were really supportive. They, they helped me find my feet again clinically, rediscover my love of the profession, gave me lots of opportunities. So I was doing angiograms and pacemakers and all this kind of stuff. But most importantly, the, the clinical director of the department, he's still my clinical director today, he discovered that I was really interested in computers. And, and he too, he, he's not a computer programmer. He's one of these guys who just turns his mind to anything. He'd clocked that something really exciting was happening here. And he ended up making a load of introductions at the university and saying, Rob, go follow your nose. And if this is interesting, take it seriously and do it. So... 2018, I ended up getting a place with a lot of support from, from David on a funded PhD program in computer science. Had a fantastic bunch of supervisors who were both really supportive and also gave me a very long leash to just go and explore that world. And I spent um, a few years uh, you know, building, training neural networks, um, playing around with all the different types of neural network and application that were out there, going to events on, on, a, on a great you know, study budget that I had available. So going to all these international meetings and meeting interesting people. And yeah, just, just it, it transformed where my career was headed. Um, and then, you know, after that, um, COVID hit towards the end of my PhD. By this time, you know, I was, I was kind of known as a card carrying computer nerd um, within the medical community of Northern Ireland, where I was now based. And I ended up getting us to go and help out at the Department of Health with some of the COVID modeling and then the, the health resource modeling. Fantastic experience working directly under our Northern Ireland Chief Scientific Officer, so learning a lot. Also realizing, though, that probably the NHS right now was not the best place to innovate um, from inside. And I, I kind of shed that, that attitude I had towards the private sector and industry and commercialization, which had always been kind of dirty words to me. I was a, I was a real thoroughbred medic in the early parts of my career. And I began to realize, actually, no, that, that's how the world changes. You have a good idea, you innovate, you commercialize, and then that's how you get it to market and in the hands of people who can do good with it. So then I, when I got a phone call from NVIDIA, who I'd encountered a couple of times, and they said, hey, Rob, we're, we're looking for a physician who's got you know, a crossover expertise in the AI space to come and um, join our team in the EMEA region, um, I thought, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to do this. And that, that turned out to be amazing. Um, terrifying, but amazing. So on, I, I was due to start on a, on a Monday in October, on my birthday, actually. And on the Friday before I was due to start, I got a phone call from one of my colleagues to say, 
By the way, Rob, just a heads up. On Monday, our CEO is going to announce that we're building the UK's largest supercomputer and we're dedicating it to health and life science research. And we want to fill it with great research and great partners. And a lot of this is about to fall on your plate. Um, Wow. And I I remember sort of breaking out in a cold sweat uh, at the time. And it did turn out to be a lot of work. But... It was amazing. It gave me license to go out and work with incredible people in, in, in academia, in, in the clinical world, in the pharmaceutical industry, and, uh, you know, have a leadership role in some collaborations, at least a leadership from our side on, on these collaborations where people, amazingly talented researchers were training largely large language models because it was, you know, huge infrastructure needed, huge AI models mm. for things like not just language processing, but um, the design of new small molecules for for drugs, mm. um, you know, genomic analysis. It, 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 it was just unreal. It was like, you know, I had to pinch myself every day. Um, and, and, and I was, I, I took on a global role after that. So I was managing this team of amazingly talented data scientists, all of whom I think were probably much smarter than I am. Um, and they, they were sort of spread from San Francisco <laughs> to Beijing. So it was just, I was a million miles away from the front lines of the NHS where I continued to rock up, uh, you know, sort of, once every one or two weeks, I was quite part time then. Anyway, I, I now I, I am coming to the end of the story now. But uh, after a couple of years at Nvidia, ha- having an amazing time and learning loads, I kind of realised actually I've drifted quite far from the point of care here, and I never wanted to leave clinical medicine entirely. In fact, I got into this world to have an impact in the world. I, you know, the world of clinical medicine, my home planet, where I care so much about. Mm. And a, a friend and colleague of mine, when I joined Nvidia, had founded a startup. And we'd actually talked about doing it together, but at the time I had young kids and, you know, wanted to go explore this industry opportunity. Declan was much braver than I am, and he took the plunge and he founded this thing. And it was doing pretty well, and he was beginning to shift in a direction where he had use cases for the kind of technologies I was really interested in, which was large language models. Mm. And so we had a conversation over coffee, and he said, Rob, you know, we could could use you in the company at this point. And I thought, yeah, okay, I, I feel like NVIDIA is a great place to work, a really amazing company that looks after its employees. But I thought, I, I've kind of learned enough here and I've got enough of an itch to scratch in terms of getting back to point of care applications that I'm going to go for this. And and that brings me to where I am now, which I guess we'll, we'll talk about in a while, what we're doing here at Olus. But um, yeah, that's that's my story. I mean, lots of being lucky enough that lots of great opportunities have, have fallen at my feet, I think is, is the headline of that. It's too modest, man. Fallen at your feet. They, they certainly haven't fallen at your feet. You have been someone that has been, I guess, bold enough to take a risk on your own. Oh, you've bet on your own happiness by taking a risk to leave, well, at least to temporarily, at least in part, leave medicine. And, you know, that that is such a, it's such a big decision for someone like yourself who, loved so much about the job and still does love so much about the job. And I can relate. I think there were, I probably loved it less than you, but I I can relate to loving elements of the job and having to leave those behind and what that does to your identity and what that does to your life. But, you know, yeah. I can see you nodding at identity. Yeah, I mean, that that's the big one, isn't it? Like, who am I? It what is, am I yeah, now? Like, absolutely. who am I to my friends anymore? Like, am I just the, the, of my, yeah, am I am I now searching for money and profit? That's not who I am. Like, am I after myself? Anyway, I could talk about this for hours with you, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna bore our listeners too much with the leaving medicine side of things. It's something that a lot of guests have obviously done, and I think th- the only thing I do want to say that I just want to congratulate you for doing it though, because I think what you've done is that you knew who you were, and actually you gravitated towards something that gave you broader contentment happiness flow state all of the above you know and i think that's not an easy thing to do when you're on a path as trodden as the medical one and i i I think that that is important but you've obviously you've moved into tech and and now the bit that i want to ask you about firstly in your journey is your move to the department of health and actually what you did for the department of health by this point you've you're someone that has gone out and well your clinical director who i actually want to give some air time to here actually for those people that are in medicine and what you know being kind to each other and supporting each other i think is 
incredibly important, particularly where healthcare is going through such a workforce crisis that it is now. And for clinical directors that do things like this, hats off to them. You had a clinical director that saw who you were, what you were about, saw something in you that loved computer science and wanted to do it. And you got supported into doing it and actually sounds like somewhat encouraged into doing it. And you were probably reticent. I've known you for 15 minutes and I imagine you were reticent (laughs) to leaving your patients behind and leaving your colleagues behind and all of those things. And this person actually encouraged you to go and do it to bet on your happiness for you. So I really rate and respect that. But you went into computer science, not only did you study it, but you then started to work in it. And actually this, this part of your journey that fascinates me is the Department of Health modeling through COVID. Now, I think this is a big black box for most of the public, including me. I have actually done a podcast actually with Pfizer on interviewing a few people about what was going on at the back end of healthcare during all of this stuff and the back end of government. And that podcast will come out soon. But I know a little bit of this stuff, but I didn't hear it from your perspective or the perspective of anyone that was doing this modeling. So tell me about the Department of Health and Social Care. What modelling were they after? What were you modelling and what were they doing with that information? And I know you can only say certain amounts of this, but tell me what you're allowed to say. Yeah, yeah, sure. So well, to set some context for my Department of Health, because I was in Northern Ireland at this point, so and healthcare has mm. evolved. Of course. Oh, so, so it was your DOH, was, yeah, fine. I was with the, the Department of Health at Northern Ireland. We were, of course, clo- closely linked to the DHSC, um, yeah. as well as SAGE, SPY-M, SPY-B, and, and those guys. So, What's SPY-M yeah, and SPY-B? I, Oh, oh, yeah. So um, the the groups. So Spy M. Um, oh, I, I actually forget what it stands for. But basically, the, um, the the group of experts who do the actual epidemiological modelling. Spy B was a behavioural expert. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, oh, you right. You've heard about them nice. in the news at the time, but they've probably faded into yeah, yeah. relative obscurity <laughs> in public consciousness since. Um, and then, of course, Sage. I think hasn't. You know, everyone still knows what Sage mm. is. Um, so I wasn't a member of Spy M, Spy B, or Sage, but other members in our Northern Ireland group were were they attended Mm. all those meetings and then came back and and reported back um i mean at at, at a high level um without going into a huge amount of detail what i saw was that it really brought out the best in people so we you know Mm. uh, the the, the task i I think this fell to the northern irish the northern irish chief scientific officer to pull together groups of experts regionally to cover all the bases that we needed to cover to advise um, you know, the healthcare leaders and, and, and the policymakers on, you know, the, what was going on with COVID, what was likely to happen, how things were likely to unfold. And a, a lot of great people were brought together. I mean, honestly, like I, I, I was surrounded by people that I was in awe of. Um, I happened mm-hmm. to be there because I, I had done some computer modeling and computer modeling of healthcare systems and bed flow and stuff like that. And I'd worked with um, mm-hmm. a, another great, uh, the, the, one of the deputy medical directors in our trust. So it, it was a question of taking the the modeling of the the um, outbreak trajectory. So you will have heard about like compartmental models and all that kind of business at the time. Um, and working out, you know, how many people were likely to get infected week on week on week. How was that going to be affected by the various interventions that were being over to, undertaken at the, at the policy level and, and the changing attitudes of individuals. So it was kind of, you know, lick your finger and stick it in the air and try and be scientific as you can <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and then the particular part where I played a role was in then um, taking the data from our health system and saying, okay, if this many people across this spread of age groups become infected on day X, um, how many people are likely to be coming into an A&E department? How many resources are we going to need there? How many are going to get admitted? Right. How many are going to wind up in ICU? How many CPAP machines, ventilators, you know, syringe drivers do we need to, to manage these people? Um, and it, it, it was amazing because you know healthcare planning is done on a you know on a on a basis of you know past trends equal future trends right we we expect mm. the supply and demand to be in in very close to equilibrium and changing extremely slowly over time and the whole system is built around that and the moment you introduce like massive variation and flux we don't have any forecasting models we don't have a proactive approach to okay something's changed and suddenly we need to approach planning in a completely different way. So we were trying to build that from scratch in a hurry. Um, I played a, a small role in that in that whole system um, where a lot of people really, you know, showed the best of themselves, did great work, 
made things happen at a pace that would have been inconceivable a few months earlier before we'd heard of COVID. Um, and it was, yeah, it, it, it was, it was, I, I think, you know, I think actually, of course, anyone involved in responding to COVID probably came in for a lot of flack from, from the media and probably still will as the various inquiries across the UK wind up. Um, but I think people really did an incredible job. And, and I think actually the situation was managed very well. You know, we didn't run out of oxygen, which people were worried about. We didn't run out of ICU beds. And yeah, okay, part of that was that the, you know, the, the, the pandemic didn't go as badly as it could have done. But part of that was that people were, were doing their best to respond. And a, a lot of people worked a lot of hours. Um, but mm. as I said, just to, just to wind that up, I, I think even as the first wave began to settle, um, this was, I guess, sort of what September, October, after the summer of, of 2020. I, I think I'm getting the timeline right there. Then mm. there was already an obvious shift towards people returning to their old ways. Um, you know, the, the system as a whole. And it was like, well, actually, the stuff we were beginning to implement during COVID did this, this proactive response to healthcare planning and healthcare provision should be how a healthcare system in the 21st century looks. And the way we were using technology to facilitate that was starting to sow the seeds of stuff that really could have blossomed. And actually the, the huge inertia, and in this case, recoil of, of, of a health system on the scale of the NHS was a little bit disheartening. Um, and, and that was the point where I thought, yeah, I've, I've had a great time and I think I've, I've played a small role in having an impact when it was needed here. But I think I'm going to end up, you know, banging my head against the wall if I stay and try and innovate within the NHS. Um, I'm sure that's a controversial that's topic. So, that that's so fascinating. It, no, it is. It is. That's so fascinating, though. So my, my question is, can you, can you give me an example of that? Because I think it must have been so satisfying, by the way, to have your decision to do computer science validated pretty much immediately by being like involved in this stuff and being able to see both of those worlds. But then obviously what you're part of is then really exciting. And you're, you're obviously now seeing, and when you're in this role, you're seeing this potential future of using technology in such a way for the planning of resources in healthcare. Now, you've just talked about recoil back to something that then wasn't as innovative as what you were looking at, what you were potentially doing. So had that recall not have happened, what is it that you're talking about there? What is the use of technology in, in, in the planning that was going so well that what could it have led to? What, what is that world that you're talking about there? Because that's the bit that I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great question. So we were capturing information at the point of care in a very granular way. And a lot of it was manual because it had to be in a hurry, right? So literally there were like, um, that there were all, you know, almost pyramid schemes. I, I'm trying to think of a better way of putting this. But <laughs> um, there would be someone on every ward in every hospital who would twice a day, uh, you know, make a list of all the patients, who was on oxygen, who wasn't on oxygen, uh, capture other salient right. information that, that kind of gave you a snapshot of the state that the ward was in and who was likely to be discharged, who was getting worse. Phone that up to a sort of a, a, a directorate lead. They would phone that up to a hospital lead. That would get sent to a central location. So you had a snapshot of our, our, our entire um, region, five, five NHS trusts, you know, about 2 million people being looked after by HSCNI, which is the Northern Irish part of the NHS. And that would be sort of assimilated. And then there would be... Um, forecasts made that would be fed back down again and it would get, get more and more granular as it went down so you'd have this regional sense of okay, right. how many regional ICU beds are we likely to have and then we'd go to say one trust say the Northern Trust and we'd say to them okay we think we, we'd you know I, I had several conversations with the regional ICU lead great great guy and, and a few times he phoned me up and he, he you know when something was changing in terms of the pandemic trajectory and it made the mainstream media Andrew would pick mm. up the phone and say, Rob, what do you think this means? Like in two weeks' time, are we going to, yeah. you know, a new variant of COVID okay. is a classic example. He'd, he'd pick this up and say, well, how many how many ICU beds do you reckon we're going to need in a couple of weeks' time? And we could kind of give him that information. It was always approximate, but we were wow. never a million miles off. And you could do that at yeah. an incredibly grand. So in terms of bed planning, in terms of staff, uh, you know, staffing wow. relocation, in terms of freeing up wards and capacity as it was needed, it just, the whole thing, it was done in a hurry and it was imperfect as a system, but it could have been, um, it could have been kind of crystallized. The infrastructure could have been in place yeah. for that to become a sustainable model of how you do healthcare. And you yeah. could have removed the more manual components. Wow. 
But instead, wow. I, I, most of those systems just fell apart when they weren't needed anymore. Um, yeah. Possibly because we were so short and staffed that people weren't willing to put in the... It's the redistribution of resource, isn't it? Yeah, it's not exactly, needing, exactly, needing. Yeah. But I get what you're saying, though. I think what you're saying is that, yes, it might have been someone manually recording that information and then feeding it into a very complex technological model, but you could even automate that that elements of capture and then get to a point where you have so much data that you can start to reorganize care and actually make loads of efficiencies on the ground floor from anywhere from ITU, HDU, ward, step down, like out into community. It seems like with more, with all that data that you were talking about at scale, you could actually start to make forecasts of so much stuff that was going on. Yeah. I mean, that's, which is funny because that's what I mean, that narrative is what so many health tech companies are doing. They're saying, so many health tech companies are saying, we can bring more data into this. You can make more decisions about reorganizing care and set up a clinic with a community pharmacist, which frees up your GPs or blah, blah, blah. But what you're saying is, is in that secondary tertiary care environment, actually it's that same concept of, well, if we know what viruses are floating around and we know what's happening at the community level and we you know start projecting what's going to happen here and we can base that on all these different things actually we can start to plan what we need and blah blah, blah. like it, it's so, it, it's so interesting but to your point there's varying elements of how much do we need this how much does how much do you need that nurse there or or you know whoever it was clark or whatever capturing that information versus other things they could be doing that are putting out exactly. fires in a different way and when covid disappears like that becomes more important so it's not not that anyone's to blame but yeah with a bit more resource wouldn't we all have a bit more resource in healthcare to start doing these different <laughs> things but um, yeah. su super interesting, man. Again, I could ask you a million questions on it. I'll have to get you back on, but I want to talk about NVIDIA next. So you were essentially headhunted to NVIDIA here and they were building the, the UK's largest supercomputer. That must have sounded epic when that was announced uh, to you or when you found that out or read that or however that information got to you. That must have been incredible for someone with you and your background to then hear that it was life sciences and healthcare research that was going to. I mean, this is the... This is the holy grail, I imagine. So an incredibly exciting role to be going into. And you mentioned it was AI drug discovery, it was genomic analysis, it was lots of things along those lines. Can you tell me about being a clinician in NVIDIA and working on that type of stuff? I mean, to your point, yeah, it sounded epic, but epically terrifying, to, to, to be completely <laughs> honest, because... You know, I no one even it turned out after the event that a lot of very very smart people who were you know data science who have been data scientists for a long time a lot of them weren't quite sure what to do with that level of compute to to really mm -hmm. you know have an impact at scale so yeah it was it was it was a big challenge um but uh, yeah also as you say very exciting by the way it was called Cambridge One so you'll find a lot of you know if anyone's interested okay. you'll find a lot of press stuff about that and, and and some of the projects that we subsequently ran on it with great partners um in terms of being a clinician at Nvidia yeah so what when I was I, I mean you're right I, I was I guess headhunted glamorized it slightly I was certainly approached um uh, you know proactively to say would I be interested in taking a role and one of the one of the things I said early on in that process was do you really need a clinician because I, you know, I, I do, I, by this time, I, I, I guess I'd been, I'd been a, a, a clinician for a decade and that wasn't a skill set I was looking to be incidental in my professional story. I wanted to use it yeah. on a regular basis. And at the time, and I think in completely good faith, they said, yeah, actually, we think that, we think that, that insight into the needs at the point of care, which is ultimately where all the technology we're working on ended, you know, had it had its mm. impact, whether it was a drug that was given to a patient or whatever, um, that their attitude was, yeah, we we, we kind of want this this um, this we want to bring insight into the company, sort of from processor to patient and back, right? So all the way up from the silicon to the software stack to the application level development to how it's delivered to patients, and it was, uh, you know, it was it was a it was a laudable ambition, and at times in certain projects, yeah, I was definitely able to to bring some value to the table in terms of that perspective. I should say I, I, I wasn't the only physician in NVIDIA. There is a cardiothoracic surgeon in the States called Mona Flores, who, who I would describe as a good friend these days. Um, so I wasn't, this wasn't the first time they'd hired a physician. Um, I actually, because I was also, you know, very into technology, had the computer science background, um, and, and perhaps through my own doing, I ended up getting more and more involved in sort of 
the technical side. And by the time I left to get back a bit closer to the point of care, I think probably my role could have largely been undertaken by someone who wasn't a physician, but rather had some sort of alternative experience of, of, of the healthcare ecosystem. Um, it, and, and I think what was, if I were to say, what, what were my key take homes? What did I leave with other than having, you know, worked upskilled hugely technically and, and gained a, a much deeper understanding of what it's like to function in that commercial environment? I, I think I left with, um, I left with a completely atti- different attitude to pharma. Because, you know, we're a bit cynical about pharma in, 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 in the medical profession as a whole. I think we're used to trying, you know, being sold stuff by drug reps. <laughs> I, that, that completely flipped on its head. You know, I'm, I'm not saying pharma never do anything bad and they're, one, and they're wonderful. But, uh, you know, I, I worked with a lot of very, very good people doing amazing research for all the right reasons working in pharma. But the absolute headline and, and, and you know, this is my soapbox that I could get on any time, and, and, and I've been on this soapbox for a number of years, is that the disconnect between the point of care and the world of technology is huge, and it's growing yeah. fast because medicine is subspecializing. Technology, even, even very competent computer scientists, many of them don't really know how these large language models that are about to change the world of technology work. You know, They don't really know what a transformer is or what multi-headed attention looks like. Uh, and... So they're both becoming much more subspecialized worlds and trying to bridge the gap between the two is, is so, so difficult. And I think that is, if I had to point to one single problem and, and someone said, why, why are we not seeing the kind of benefits we should at the point of care from the amazing technologies that we access through the likes of Google and Microsoft every day? That's why. It's, it, there's a knowledge gulf there, I think. And, mm. and what I liked about Olus and the reason... I made the jump despite being in this incredibly privileged position at NVIDIA was that, you know, Olus is a physician founded company and I was the fifth physician in mm. very, very focused on having an impact at the point of care first and foremost. And, and, you know, AI was only a toolkit we reached for and we still reach for if it was the right toolkit to solve a particular problem. And I think that's kind of the way to do technology, get a bunch of guys, by the way, four of the physicians in Olus are in the engineering function. So I'm one of four mm. guys who writes code every day and, 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 so that, that's, that was the appeal of that company. And that generally, that theme of um, whenever I encounter medics who have really kind of taken more than a passing journey into the world of computer science, software development, AI, whatever it may be, uh, they're often the people I think, yeah, this is, you, you've got a really important role to play here in, in being an interface between those mm. two different worlds. Before we go on to talk about Olus, there's, some, there's, some, there's an element here that I really really want to talk about which is this disconnect clearly frustrates you and you've mentioned large language models there because we're at a time as we sit here right now we're at a time where that gulf could really go exponential i mean we talk we talk about takeoff in terms of ai takeoff but i mean that that gulf is is very likely to take off um with where we're at with large language models I want to ask you a relatively open question here to see just where you are with this, but what's it like, what's it been like for you recently with the knowledge that you have, the experience that you have as both a clinician and a computer scientist, what's it been like for you recently as someone so informed about large language models and healthcare I think that's my question. What's it been like for you recently <laughs> being so informed? I mean, you, so you mentioned there this word, right? You mentioned multi-headed detention or something uh, that sounded a, 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 like attention, that. Attention, yeah. Uh, uh, right, multi-headed attention, right? I don't know what that is. I don't know what that means. I don't know. So there's so much I don't know about large language models. So perhaps even start there about like, what is a large language model? How How is it? going to be used in health or how do you think they're going to be used in healthcare and what's it like what's it been like for you receiving all of this information and this sort of conjecture almost about large language models and what they might do and what they could do versus what you're probably actually doing with them so yeah talk to me about a lot of large, large language models and what it's been like for you recently yeah yeah uh, it, it, it's a great question and I, and I think even even the, the answer is probably I mean the, the, it, it's a multifaceted answer right but one of the words I would reach for for sure is frustrating as much as anything, I frustrate myself with my inability to explain this stuff 
to my colleagues. <laughs> um, some people have a real talent for that. You know, you know the way kind of knowledge is built. It's like it's like building blocks of different concepts that you have to stack one on top of the other. And if you become, you know, if you do a PhD in a field and you go on and you really spend a lot of time in that field, the stuff you're dealing with, the concept, the abstract concepts you're working with on a day to day basis, sit on top of like a Jenga block of so many other concepts that in order to explain what you're doing, you have to relay, you have to mm-hmm. find a way of summarizing all those other building blocks to someone else. I, I'm very much at that point. I think I think back in the early days, I used to be a lot better ex- at explaining, you know, the, the basic concepts of AI. But now we are at a point where to explain what a large language model is and to try and go into, you know, multi-headed attention is, I was reaching for that as a, as a, as a particularly technical concept. But even to explain, you know, how do you get to the point where you make a word into a number, where you take a number and turn it into something called a... Uh, a, a semantic embedding, and then you use that to engage in you know highly abstract thought and reasoning. How do you how do you bring someone on that journey to the point where they understand what these things are and what they do? I I can't do it because I'm not talented enough in that in that space, and, and I find that frustrating. Um, and I also find it quite frustrating that a lot of I, I I would never describe myself as an expert right anyone I think I always think anyone who describes themselves as an expert should raise <laughs> red flags because the only thing as you dive deeper into world the only thing that you realize is you know the, the thing you know is how much you don't know um and, I, and I've I've been fortunate enough to work with so many extraordinarily talented people who are so much smarter than me that I I uh but not being an expert, but I have spent a lot of time working in this world. And so I do, you know, I, I could, if I had the time, explain to you, I could bore the socks off you by kind of walking <laughs> through how large language models work, what a, what a large, you know, uh, autoregressive transformer network is, how it uses multi-headed attention and all that kind of, all that kind of super nerd stuff. I, I read a lot of stuff coming from people who, who really don't know this space, um, uh, uh, you know, who, who, you know, you go on LinkedIn and everyone's an expert and, I don't know. It's difficult, right? That's a problem that the world at large is wrestling with. I mean, you know, it probably explains the US elections back when Trump got in. It probably explains Brexit. Mm -hmm. People don't know where to go for high quality information these days. And that's true Mm -hmm. across all domains. And this is just one of them. Um, So there's an element of that. There's also an element of it being incredibly exciting because, you know, I do know enough about these things to, I I think, to really realize they, they, I'm allergic to hype generally. I, I really don't mm. like the hype, particularly surrounding AI. But people have used terms like, you know, large language models are the new industrial revolution. That's maybe a step too far. They are huge. Mm. Their implications mm. are going to be so profound over the coming years and decades that mm. as someone who kind of, you know, read the attention is all you need paper back in 2018, as soon as it came out, this is like the seminal paper that described kind of, you know, the grandfather of what is now GPT-4. I, you know, I, I was plugged in enough to that world. I read it very shortly after it came out and sat back and thought, wow. And I've just been watching the whole thing unfold um, and, you know, had, had a tiny, tiny, tiny part in that world. And it's been an absolute privilege. It feels like having, a, you know, a front row seat or maybe a second mm-hmm. row seat in my case um, <laughs> to history unfolding. Uh, so, yeah, yeah a, 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 a mix of those different things. And, and, I, and I think to hark back to what I said before, that, the thing that's really challenging about it is I, is I do see, like I, I was at HIMSS in Chicago recently, HIMSS being a huge, mm. as, as you know, James, a, a huge medical IT conference. And we had Peter Lee um, in mm. the, the panel discussion to kick the conference up. Peter Lee's the, the vice president and general manager of Microsoft Research and, and Microsoft, Microsoft yeah. of course. And, yeah. So Microsoft have effectively, if not in practice, bought OpenAI and, and are mm. world leaders now in this space. And it was interesting because Peter Lee clearly knows his stuff very much about, you know, AI and, 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 and large language models. But he was talking about the interface with healthcare. And I'm sitting there listening to him as a practicing physician thinking, oh, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd love you to have a little bit more insight into the world of frontline medicine because some of the stuff you're saying is making me think oh, that's coming from the place of someone who hasn't done their 10,000 hours on the front lines and doesn't understand mm-hmm. the reality. Some of the some of the proposed use cases he was throwing out, I was like, yeah, maybe. But, um, and, and it's difficult because I think there are, there are not that many people who have, have that crossover expertise. Mm. Um, and, and, I, and, and, and I wish there were more, but I can't, I can't help with that because I'm so, I'm so poor at explaining it that I can't be the teacher who brings all my, all my medical um, 
colleagues along with me. So I think I think what we're what an individual in this world today who I would say is extremely high value is someone who's a medic, a tech head, and is a great teacher and can bring mm. people on that journey. They are going to be worth their weight in gold moving forwards. Do you find yourself thinking about those use cases? And because I I do, and I get I overwhelm myself really quickly because I sort of it's sort of everything and nothing right now. It's so raw and it, we know it hallucinates and we know how far it is from being regulated as a medical device. Anyone that sort of vaguely knows this stuff knows how far it is from genuinely being you know, a, a, a medical device. And so I, but I still get very overwhelmed, like thinking about the, all the potential that it has versus where it's at now versus what is actually the low hanging fruit for it and how could it be used in healthcare if it's not necessarily on the front line what can it do at the back end what could it do in yeah. admin what could it do in back office like that i i thought i but again i overwhelm myself really quickly because in part i i i, I know as much as sort of a the the general interested person in tech knows I don't know anywhere near the extent that you do of how the tech actually works, but I do also have all this sort of more limiting knowledge, which is that I know what a medical device needs to be. <laughs> I know what you need to do to yeah, become yeah, a medical yeah. device. So I know, I also know it's not going to do any of that anytime particularly soon. And so I, I, I find myself jumping really quickly between like optimism, pessimism, realism, optimism, pessimism, real and it's just like fast cycle <laughs> that I go through whenever I think about large language models. But do you think yeah. about this? And if you do, do you have any ideas of what the low-hanging fruit might be or where the potential is at least first? Do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess I'm, 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 I'm lucky enough these days that that's my job really is to think about that, think about how we can use these things in a very safe, very transparent way that nonetheless has an impact at the point of care. So, I mean, I guess, and, and, and stop me, James, if I start waffling on here, but just, just to walk you back to a couple of the basic concepts around lang large language models, just, mm. to, just to kind of bring you to, to, to where I'm thinking about this. So you think back to like GPT-3. Uh, I can't remember when it came out, but it was, it was um, a huge deal when it came out, right? GPT-3 was uh, at the end of an era where the way, you transform, the way you trained a very large language model was you threw loads of text at it and you made it read that text. And basically what it did is it slowly memorized large chunks of that text. It was a predict, large language models are predict the missing word tools, or at least that's how they're trained, right? Mm. So GPT-3 was a 175 billion parameter AI model. That's huge. And it was, it was trained on a, on a significant chunk of the public internet, you know, Wikipedia and, and, and Reddit and all these. I don't know exactly, I can't remember exactly what it was trained on, but a lot of PubMed. And as it goes through the training, right, it, it, it memorizes all this stuff and... And, and then afterwards, you can ask it a question like, you know, uh, you know, say let's you know, streptococcal bacteria are, you know, are they gram positive or gram negative? Are they aerobic or anaerobic? And it'll, it'll answer that question for you because it's read a document and memorized that information. That's a little bit dangerous because, first of all, your information gets out of date very quickly. Second of all, mm. it's, it's kind of spewing out what it's learned and it will have picked up stuff wrong and it will do what we call hallucinating. And I'm not convinced by the term hallucinating, but it does mm. do that. And. GPT-4, which is, you know, Peter Lee during that, con that panel discussion at Microsoft, OpenAI very cagey about the actual architecture of GPT-4, but Peter Lee let slip that it's a multi-trillion parameter AI model. If you draw an extremely fast and loose um, analogy with biological brains, I mean, we're into, you know, we're into the size, the, the number of artificial neural synapses that mammalian brains have here, so a huge model. It's also trained in a predict, using a predict the missing word task. So it does memorize a whole bunch of stuff. But the whole paradigm has shifted recently where someone realized, and, and you, could, you could bet your life that it was Google, um, someone realized that actually instead of making these models rote learn all this information, let's give them access to a search engine when they're training, mm. effectively a search engine, and let's allow them to access the internet in real time as they're training. So if, if, if you now, if GPT-4, you've given a task during its training of saying, you know, streptococcal, streptococcal, mm. you know, streptococcal bacteria are a type of gram something uh, bacteria, it can formulate and execute an internet search, pull in the relevant information, read the information, mm. and then answer the question based on that information. So this is what we call retrieval augmentation. That's 
how these modern transformers work. Now, I think that's quite a different prospect. And I think it's a really, it sounds like a very technical difference, but it's very, very important because what models like GPT-4 are learning is to interpret text that you feed it in real time and return responses from that text. So you're not relying quite so heavily on them just, you know, rote learning and regurgitating information. And I think that opens up all sorts of interesting use cases where you can actually, you can feed them in source information from sources of your choice and have them return answers from that source information. And as long as you maintain the original information behind the scenes, it's always accessible. They become a time-saving tool, right? They don't become a treatment recommender. Recommender, you know, you don't use. It's going to be a long time before we use GPT-4 to just ask it straight out. Oh, I've got a patient who's having an NSTEMI. You know, what antiplatelet should I give them, and what <laughs> doses? That would be terribly unsafe. However, mm-hmm. to say to GPT-4, okay, here's my question: Can you find? Can you read a whole bunch of documents and find me the right line of the right document that that answers my question? It's, of course, exactly what Bing are doing. Now they're integrating GPT-4. It's what Google will try yeah. and do with BARD. And I think that's, I think that's the immediate use case. That and the, the ability to structure unstructured information. Um, though, again, you're into you know, the possibility of mistakes. If, if it's structuring information in medical records and it makes a mistake, that's a bit more serious. But I, I think that the power of good information retrieval should never be overlooked just because it's not the sexiest application out there. You know, Google changed the world in a profound way. Chat GPT, I... I keep doing this. Models along the lines of GPT-4, large <laughs> retrieval augmented autoregressive language models, to be more technical. Um, they are, I, I think, just being able to deliver the right information very, very quickly at the point of care is going to make a huge difference because the amount of time, there are a lot of good studies saying that, particularly in the States, but it's becoming true in the UK, a lot of physicians are spending over 50% of their working hours just interacting with computers, putting information into the EHR, pulling it out, going and cross-referencing with medical sources. Over 50% of their hours at a time when we're heading for a 10% global work- workforce shortage. Um, that's crazy. And solving that problem alone, which I think you can do relatively safely without straying into you know, ethically questionable or, or mm. regulatorily questionable territory – that's going to be application, and, and it's going to it's going to revolutionise medicine. And that's before we've even got into the the sci-fi applications where GPT four becomes or, or its 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 successors become AI doctors. So that 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 that's how I see things going. And I and I, I, to me, it's it, it, it's pretty clear. But I think because we're not having that sensible conversation, or at least people are hearing lots of noise from other people proposing these crazy ideas that will just never fly in today's medical ecosystem. We haven't, as a, we haven't as a medical community landed on the fact that, oh, hang on, these things can make a huge impact right now, very safely. Let's do that. It'll take us a while to get there, in which time the medical community will come totally terrified, very resistant to technology, slowly climb back down. And then you know, mm. probably a few years down the line, we'll start saying, oh, yeah, OK, we need to we need to start adopting this stuff on a, or at scale. Rant over. Yeah. <laughs> well, not a rant at all. I think it's actually just incredibly powerful information that. But you're right. One of the dangers is and this is the problem with hype. I can see why, you know, you, you don't like hype, because the problem with a hype curve is that it has a peak and then a and then a massive trough <laughs> like that's what we want to avoid yeah. because actually if this stuff can be really useful, this is a time where empowering the workforce and actually just making lives better for clinicians and, and staff generally is just, is really, really, really important. And here's a tool that's coming along at this time. It seems like ideal timing if we can harness it in the right way to solve that problem. An issue is that the noise that's created by, oh, hey, it's going to be like chatbots for diagnosing people and treating people, all these words that make you cringe if you know anything about software as medical device regulation, but it, it's that that we don't want to put people off. We want to find a way to do this safely, as you say, and actually w- exactly what you've talked about as a, as an information tool, as an information mechanism, an information transfer mechanism at scale. You're right. That's an area where it definitely can be low hanging fruit. So with this in mind, then you mentioned that fortunately thinking about this stuff is part of your job. Um, Olas Medical, tell me about what it is that you're doing at Olas Medical, what Olas Medical does, and if you are doing any large language model stuff, throw some of that in. Yeah, for sure. So, okay. Yeah, Olas Medical, so our tagline is everything you need in one place. 
right? and what we are is a it's a platform for the clinical workforce to put all their non-patient information, so largely operational stuff and guidelines, into one kind of cloud-based platform that you can access via mobile native interfaces and web interfaces, but you know mostly mobile, at the bedside really, really fast. So we focus on people uploading their information. We, we like to store it in, in a sensible way so that they can navigate through our interfaces very, very intuitively. And then a big part of our value prop is, uh, you know, returning search results quickly. So that, to give you an example, you know, I, I am at the bedside. Okay, NSTEMI isn't the best example because most people who treat <laughs> NSTEMIs know off the top of their head, you know, aspirin into or whatever. But, you know, something slightly more obscure, like, you know, I've got a child with a head injury and I can't quite remember when I should CT them when, when I shouldn't. You know, I need, the, I need to look up the nice guidelines or my hospital's local guidelines. Whip out your phone, you, you connect it with the information in three or four seconds. Same thing for the rotor. I'm on call this weekend. Same thing for, um, you know, the contact for, okay, um, you know, this patient with an end STEMI, I need to phone cardiology, what's their number? So it, it's very, very pragmatic in that sense. Um, you know, we, we're just about connecting people with information quickly. That's our core value proposition. Um, it was actually, I think one of the nice things is that the, the, the first iteration of the platform was built by my colleague Declan, who I've mentioned. He, he's an emergency medicine physician. He built this to solve a pain point he felt at the point of care. You can imagine in ED, particularly because it's cross-specialty, you're accessing a lot of information all the time, referring to different specialties, looking up different guidelines. So he built it, and it just kind of scaled from there. And we're in, we're in about 140 centers across mostly the UK and the US, including some really big names. Um, and, and we get great feedback about the platform. In terms of the large language models, I mean, it, it, it's our primary focus is exactly the use case I just talked about, right? We're, we can, we're using, and this isn't in production right now. We're, we're, we're sort of building this behind the scenes. So mm -hmm. if someone goes out and downloads our app, which is, which is free to, to download and use, and anyone could go to olasmedical.com. That's E-O-L-A-S, medical.com, the Irish word for, for knowledge or information because we're an Irish company. Just download it, get yourself set up, and away you go. You know, you get all the public-facing guidelines from NICE off the shelf, and then you populate your own content into this secure environment. But... What what we think is that we can use language processing technology to do even better, to really connect people very quickly with the information they need. And I think actually that's particularly the, – in the immediate future, it's particularly important with operational information. Because if you, if you want to know, you know, <laughs> does my center use Prazagrel or aspirin or Tecagrel or whatever, an NSTEMI, you know you're going to Google NSTEMI. You know what guideline you're looking for. You get it quickly. If you want to know – how do I organize a CT scan out of hours in my local hospital? Like, that's the stuff that's a pain to find. You know, you don't just have the search terms at, at, at the top of your head and you're not quite sure where the information lives. So I think I, I'm not one, none of us at the company are ones for solving, you know, looking for a problem to solve with the technology we like. We want to solve problems. And if, te if there's a technological solution, great. I think there's probably, I think that's probably a high impact problem to solve. The ability to say, say into your smartphone, oh, I've just, you know, I'm doing a locum shift in this hospital. I've just rotated into a new hospital. How do I organize a CT scan out of hours? How do I get a neurology opinion? How do I do X, Y, and Z? So actually, it's, it's not a very sexy use case for language models. But what we're doing is we're looking at indexing all that information as it's uploaded to our content in a way that's eminently searchable. Then we can introduce large language models as a step in a search pipeline just to, mm. just to basically help return the best possible results rather than to generate answers because we don't want our models hallucinating. And then I think what we'll do further down the line is we'll start to shift into – we're already doing this in research, but we'll, we'll start to shift into – doing the same thing with clinical guidelines. And what we'll do is we'll try and sync that with a general shift in the wider community. So I think if you look at, say, Nuance, to pick one company, Nuance, who are now owned by Microsoft, so we've had very early access to, to GPT-4, Nuance are doing some incredible stuff where they're putting ambient listeners in into consultations, transcribing your notes for you, providing you with decision support if you want it, so guideline best recommendations, and then offering to go and request your x-ray for you or order your bloods. For me, for sure, that is the future of healthcare. I'm glad Nuance are doing it, not me, because they've got billions of pounds behind them and, and, and hopefully long attention spans. We're not quite ready for it, but like in 10 years' time, if that's not the way I'm practicing, I'll have probably left the medical frustration out, the profession yeah. out of pure frustration. What's going to happen then? And, and I think not that many people have realized it is – 
what right now, if you have your hospital's own local guidelines, the only way they ever get accessed is by a human being reading a PDF or a Word document, right? So no one really cares that much about how they're managed. Um, they often throw them on an intranet somewhere. Then we come along and we say, well, actually, we can give your clinicians much faster access. They say, fine. They throw them on our platform instead. Moving forwards, these things have just become machine readable, you know, because of large language models. And, and as we've already said, for ethical and regulatory reasons, we're not quite there yet, but we're very, very close to the point where a large language model can pass out, say, a nice guideline written in completely unstructured text and bring it into cross-reference that with patient information. And, and there are various different ways you could do that in a very low risk setting. You'll always, you know, you'll always stray into regulatory territory if you go down that route. But you can make very, very gentle, very transparent suggestions to clinicians in real time. But, you know, what, what your clinician wants, as we all know, is they want to have this stuff cross reference with their local guidance. Uh, and, and no one's really thinking about that at the moment. No one's thinking about the fact that no major technology company can get at this local guidelines to help people structure it, to make it available in these next generation tools. We, we kind of are. So our, our main focus is delivering value to clinicians at the point of care right now, you know, technology agnostic. We want to use large language models to do that even better. And then I think we're thinking about in the future Actually, some, what, I'm going to use some technical terms now, but a semantic search platform that manages clinical guidelines across many hospitals, I think is going to become very, very impactful in the probably not too distant future. So that's kind of our long vision for where we're going. Um, so that's OLAS in a nutshell. But like I said, right now, you can go download it, use it. It's a utility app, basically, that helps your clinicians do their job a lot more efficiently and hopefully with less frustration and also it's extremely pretty because we've got two great graphic designers <laughs> that's that's important i was about right? to say less I, I was actually just going to make that point of um i don't want to don't want to devalue all of the heavy large language model tech stuff that you've just said but it looks really nice <laughs> the front end is yeah. glorious in terms of its graphic design i love the brand i love the kind of I mean, I, we've been getting more into this into this stuff with our creative director and graphic designers as well. But the type, the, the typography, the iconography, the, the way that you've done it makes it a platform that's fun to use and actually nice to look at, which makes a huge difference. It's not a. It doesn't look like like Windows ninety five. It looks like a modern platform doing a modern thing, and actually just takes the friction away from everything, just feeling laborious. And actually, when you're trying to look up guidelines or trying to look at, yeah, you're, you're trying to look up local antibiotic guidelines to treat that, you know, cellulitis or whatever. Like it, it's, it, it's just another platform you've got to look at that day. So to actually, and, and this is something that we come to quite a lot with tech actually on this podcast, which is that you can solve the problem. And actually that's one way to making an app relatively sticky. If you then make it joyous, it's then a whole nother level that you've just accessed of making that app sticky and, and people wanting to actually be on it. And it's, you know, the, the classic one we talk about is the, if you tick, if you tick off enough tasks in Asana, then you get a unicorn that flies across the screen. And that's always quite nice to look at. It's just these like, you know, it's just these nice little things yeah, in task management that are touches. just like, ah, oh, that, yeah. that's just, it's, yeah, it brings joy. And actually to not only solve the problem, but bring the joy along with it, you know, why not? We're actually talking about the rebound yeah. that we've got currently going on as well and things like that, but it's important. I think. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I, I, I think, yeah, and I think that's a great point, right? You, you download an app like that, like Olus or, 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 or whatever it is, and you play with it and you think, oh, this is fun and playful. Someone's had fun designing it. But actually, you're right, it is super important because it minimizes cognitive load, and that's really, really important yes. at the bedside. Uh, and, and then, as you say, if you can give a little dopamine hit every so often, you know, we need it. We need it now more than ever. So I, I think it's easily overlooked, but it's super important. Yeah, I agree. Totally I agree. agree. And, and uh, by the way, totally I do agree. none of the graphic design because I am talentless when it comes to that <laughs> stuff. But our, our graphic designers are really good. I want to finish off by talking about that future vision of healthcare that the you mentioned nuance and and I assume others are building. I've noticed recently with um, with GPT four this that they've added particularly. I think it's in the US. I don't think they've rolled it out here yet because I can't seem to access it. But the the API functions, the things like Open Table. And all the different things that yep. mean that it won't only answer your question of what are the five best restaurants in the local area of New York that I'm visiting. It will then ask you, do you want to book the top? Do you want me to see if the top one's free or do you want me to book whichever one's free at whatever time or whatever? And then it will just API into OpenTable and it will just book that stuff. 
it's that that you're talking about here, isn't it? Where essentially you're building out these APIs to other applications within healthcare that jobs can then go and be done. That you know, the blood testing one is is a great example of. Well, if it's if it's listened to the consultation, it's summarised the notes, it's looked at local guidance as to what the best antibiotics actually are. Then it's going to do those. It's going to ask you, do you want to do baseline bloods for those yeah. medications and blah blah blah, in order to then give that super powerful antibiotic that we need to keep in that range. And do you want me to book the six hour one, and the twelve hour one, and the one that ones over the next few days? And do you want me to send you reminders? And and, 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 and you know th- that. That's really interesting because I think the holy grail for us all has been, or the frustration for us all that's, that work clinically has always been like, I want to practice at the top of my license. I want to actually just be, I mean, that's you know, anyone in any job ever in Crimea River that people have to do admin. Of course you do. And there's always overhead. But to be actually, to, to think of this world where, you know, even in primary care, a GP could actually be sat there and that 10 minutes of that consultation could actually be purely a focused conversation with the patient where they're looking directly in the patient's eyes, talking directly to the patient. The patient feels incredibly looked after and listened to. And actually those notes are then just captured. Those investigations are then ordered and done. And as you say, that load is taken off the clinicians who even then have to think about and do all those different things. And that it's interesting that you say if that's not the way I'm practicing in 10 years, then I might leave. I mean, is is that doable in the next 10 years? Do you really, I mean, I see it in the way that GPT-4 is interacting with OpenTable and a lot has to happen to get us there. But I mean, is is that realistic in 10 years? Yeah, yeah. 100% is, is the short version of my answer to that. Um, mm. what, what you're describing is in the world of tech called um, a large language model agents approach. Mm. Right, which is where you, you, you express what you want done in natural language to a model like GPT-4, and then it interfaces with many other systems to get the job done. Um, it, we're already, you know, at, to put this into context, and, and as part of um, just kind of exploring what we can do in this space and what we can build, the weekend before last, so to, to, put, an, to put a bit of additional context on this, we've just had our fourth child, um, because we're completely mad. Clearly. Congratulations. And she's now, uh, yeah, thanks. She's uh, just coming up on 12 weeks old, actually, soon. So I have an under-desk treadmill and a sit-stand desk at home. And what I'll often do is when she's grumpy and I need to, uh, you know, just take her off and settle her, I'll, I'll, I'll stick her in a sling, march along my treadmill and work away on my computer and kind of everyone's happy. So I've actually been doing a lot of work over weekends and occasionally I indulge myself and do some, some different stuff. Um, so two weekends ago, and, I, and, I, and I'm not over-exaggerating here, two weekends ago, I, I, I had seen the nuance demo of their ambient listener that, that mm. transcribes your conversation, summarizes it, provides you with decision port, and then offers to, to, go and, um, to go and do stuff for you, you know, interface with different clinical systems to order tests and whatnot. And I'd seen it, and, and, and on a Friday evening, I was marching along the treadmill, and, and I knew I had a couple of hours of, of treadmill time ahead of me, and I thought, I wonder what it would take to do that. Now, we already, as part of our kind of, you know, R&D activities, we'd built a semantic search guideline and already indexed all the NICE guidelines. Um, we actually speak to NICE. Reg- in fact, I'm speaking to some of the guys from NICE this afternoon. A great organization, very forward thinking, just to throw it out there. They're really on top of where this world is going and how they can best provide evidence to support it in the right format. Anyway, so we, we already had a semantic search engine that we've built for, for it to index all the NICE guidelines. And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can do what Nuance did and specifically, you know, have an ambient listener for a clinical consultation, summarize it, cross-reference this with the nice guidance, give me feedback, and then offer to do stuff for me. And, I mean, the baby was probably quite fussy uh, over the weekend because I, I had quite a lot of treadmill time. By the Monday morning, I'd built it. Um, and, and it wasn't even that difficult because this technology is so powerful that once you know what you're doing with it, it can it can just take so much of the the hard work out of this. So in terms of is it technically possible? It's technically possible today, like and and with very mm-hmm. high fidelity. Like GPT four, okay, it sometimes hallucinates, but it's a very 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 good model, and they're only going to get better. So the, the question is not a the question is not a technological one. Absolutely, that, that that question's already been answered. Um, mm. The question is an ethical and a regulatory one. Um, by the way, if anyone's listening wants a quick demo of that thing, uh, you know, feel free to ping me an email. It's it's not something we're going to produce or sell, but you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, 
the, the question is ethical and it's regulatory and it's in terms of cultural acceptance. And the reason I feel very confident that at least if we're talking about time, year, 10 year time frame, we're going to get there is that the impetus is so great at the moment. You know, necessity is a mother of invention or necessity in the case of the NHS is the mother of overcoming our huge inertia. We, we're falling apart. I mean, for my money, and, and, I, and I still practice on the, on, you know, I still practice clinical medicine. I have a permanent job. At a, so I'm there on the front lines and the, the system is falling apart around us. We're so short staffed. The morale is rock bottom. Our waiting lists are unconscionable at the moment. And something serious has to give. And we're not far off a tipping point, I think, um, in, in terms of the public consciousness and the, uh, and the appetite among the medical profession to actually say we have to do something different here. And this technology is so obviously the solution. And we're going to see it rolled out in early adopters. So nuance are already are already trialing their technology in a couple of big centers in the States. I've heard rumors, and we, you know, I have no relationship with them and I'm not under NDA or anything. I've mm. heard new rumors that places like the Cleveland Clinic, they're actually using this. What we're going to see is we're going to see the US go early probably with this kind of technology. It's going to be amazing. And we're in the NHS going to be falling apart, massively short staff, gaps all over the place, mm. desperately needing efficiency gains. I just don't think that no matter how great the cultural or regulatory or ethical barriers, I don't think we can continue to resist in the face of what's about to happen. So I think a decade might be about the right timescale, sadly, um, because it would be great if we could do this sooner. But yeah, I, I for my money, like I would be absolutely stunned if this stuff hasn't made its way to the front lines even in our healthcare system within the next 10 years, because I, I just don't think the math's add up. I think there would be, you know, revolt. We're already seeing strikes left, <laughs> right and centre. You know, we can't get much worse. And if we have our current situation with an obvious solution just across the pond, people will not tolerate that for too mm. long before they start voting with their feet. That's what mm. I think. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'm an optimist, maybe I'm an idealist, but that, that's where I sit on this. I think that's wonderful, Rob. And actually, I want to end on that optimism because I think that is... A, a wonderful vision. And I think it, knowing that we talked about light at the end of the tunnel, reaching consultant and things like that. I think light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that there is a better way to do your job and run the workforce, N just knowing that exists, I think is so powerful. I think coming from you as well, someone that currently works on the NHS frontline, someone who knows large language models, knows the technology behind them. I think you are one of the very few almost fully informed people to actually have a decent opinion on this. And actually, I, I, I trust your opinion on this. And I think, yes, there are incumbents. Yes, there are adoption challenges. And yes, there are regulatory hurdles that we will need to get over. Of course, there are. Like, that's understandable and we know that. But I'm with you that actually the pressure bottom up from those people that know something exists from a technological standpoint, but don't have access to it in their work life, yet have access to it everywhere else. We're back to smartphones and we're back to online banking and we're back to, I can do everything on my phone in my personal life. Why can't I do anything in healthcare on my phone? And we've seen that through patients. We've seen that through people just using like basic OCR engines to like take pictures of notes to then just like be able to put it into a different platform and things like that. People do start to use this stuff. And I think that bottom up pressure, that demand that will be caused by early adopters showing what's possible, I think will be unbearable. I'm with you. I genuinely, I, I also think that. And so I do think there's light at the end of the tunnel. I do want to be optimistic about this. There is no way that in a hundred years we'll be practicing healthcare exactly the same. So of course we're going to start doing things differently. And of course, large language models are going to be involved. And so it's which side of that fence do you want to be on? Do you want to be, it's, just, it's been the same with AI and it's going to be the, more broadly and it's going to be the same with large language models. So I do think we're optimistic. I'm optimistic. And I think it's been an absolute pleasure having you on, mate. I'm so, so glad in such a timely fashion that we've got you on talking about this stuff. And I definitely want to get you back on to talk about some of the other stuff that we didn't get to. But um, in the meantime, for those of you listening or for those people listening, sorry, that want to hear more from you or want to get in touch with you or want to hear more about OLS Medical, what's the best way for them to do so? Yeah, uh, visit the website, olasmedical.com, like I said, E-O-L-A-S. Um, 
and I think that we, we, we've got a contact link or, you know, I'm, I'm usually open to being to being pinged directly on, you know, LinkedIn or one of those other platforms. Um, it's just a question of how busy I am in terms of my, <laughs> my, my response times. But uh, James, it's been, it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to be on. I'm slightly, as I said at the beginning of our call, I'm slightly starstruck and it's weird kind of hearing this <laughs> voice I've listened to on the podcasts <laughs> while you're on the screen in front uh, of me. But it's, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Really appreciate it. Too kind, my friend. Thank you so much.